Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Scott Haynes, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. Scott is trained side by side with Gary Halbert. He's written for some of the top business and direct marketing companies in the world, including Jay Abraham, Robert Allen, Agora, Donald Trump, and many more. He's highly sought after because he has an unusual knack for creating sales letters that pull in high responses for very expensive products. He's sold five to $25,000 seminars or even 10,000 plus per year personal services. He's worked with many number one New York Times bestsellers as well. Scott, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Glad to be here, Jeremy. So I'm excited to hear some of your big lessons learned, mistakes along your journey, what works, what didn't work. I always like to include a fun fact about about you, a fun fact which is really interesting, which you are a national champion powerlifter as a teenager, a national level karate master, and a national level BMX competitor. What did you learn from your powerlifting days? That takes extreme discipline, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, it's it's <clears throat> it's directly applicable. Um especially when it comes to just putting in the work. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did with copywriting because before I I teamed up or got the opportunity, let me rephrase that. <clears throat> with Gary Halbert, I spent a lot of time, you know, just learning and reading and practicing writing copy. Mhm which is what you have to do because I, I, you know, to relate it to the powerlifting deal, when I started out and the reason I started, I, I'd been an athlete all my life. My brother was a a really good high school athlete, Mm -hmm. all state in track wrestling and football, a a state champion wrestler. Uh, They won state as a football team. So, you know, he he was, he was who I looked up to. And I had another brother who was also real good, not quite as good, but, but close. So, you know, I wrestled from the time I was five or six years old. Really? Yeah, yeah. And I, I forgot to mention that to you. But uh, that's another thing where you learn extreme discipline. Uh, because you have to, you know, I, I know they still do it. You, you have to cut weight, which means yeah. you don't for days. Right. <laughs> uh, so you, you learn, you know, just some really good disciplines. And, and it's a lot of training, a lot of practice. And and really, that's how I learned copywriting. Uh, is all I knew to do was just. And I've been a lifelong reader. I was always a reader. Uh, even uh, you know, with the powerlifting, I went into reading books about it, what was available. There wasn't a lot, but right. you know, I kind of dug deep with it and and uh, read about it as well as as, as trained relentlessly. And what what I was going to say, the reason why I started in powerlifting is because I was extremely weak. You know, it's, it's the overcompensate. I started school a year early and I'm kind of jumping around here. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I started school a year early. So everybody's a year older than me. And then, you know, that matters a lot. Oh, because, huge. Yeah. yeah. And I really didn't mature fast. I, and I mean, I was getting out of high school when I, you know, there were guys and I remember this specifically, there was a guy who's a friend of mine who grew a full beard between the sixth and seventh grade. I, I, I think I was 30 or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, abnormal though. Yeah. Yeah. That was really weird. He, he was, he was kind of a hairy ape, but, uh, so, you know, it was, I, it's, it's the overcompensation thing. Yeah. And, uh, I figured you were going to say that you got beat up by your brother, so you took on powerlifting so you could defend yourself or something. Well, there was no hope. I mean, there is now, but uh, they were so much older than me. The the oldest one, who was the the real the, the good athlete, uh, he's thirteen years older than I am, and my the next one is eight years older. So you know, there, I just got beat up. There there was no. <laughs> I got beat up and tortured, and I've got a sister. And if it weren't for her, I might have been. Uh, you know, left uh, in a ditch. Exactly. A few times. So yeah, <laughs> yeah there was no hope of that. Uh, that wasn't the reason, yeah. but you know, I want to talk about some of your influences growing up, but first I have to ask what's some of the top advice Gary Halbert gave you? Um, well, let's just relate it to, to copywriting. Yeah. Um, the, you know, one of my favorites that I keep in the forefront of my mind is 
you don't have to get it perfect. You just have to get it going. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's his take on, you know, movement over meditation. And another one that's specifically copywriting is, is just, you know, just because you write it down one way, doesn't mean it's going to be published that way or put online. So those things take a lot of pressure off. Um, and th those are things that eliminate quote unquote writer's block and just get you moving. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if you're just stuck on where to go, you just start moving and, uh, typically you will find, you know, you will, you will catch fire at some point or, or something will happen. Not always. Uh, but if you do it, and here's another thing, <clears throat> there can be days in a row where, you know, you just start moving, start trying to write on a piece or a promo and you're just, you're, you're just stinking up the room. <laughs> but you just keep doing it. Almost always something will come out and, uh, you'll, you'll be off to the races. Yeah. What other top advice did he give you? Um, you know, the, the physical aspect and, and just working out, uh, he was big on that. Um, even though he's passed away now, he was extremely healthy up until the point he passed away. It was, it was kind of a, uh, odd deal, but that, if you take care of that, it helps everything else. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take care of the physical, the mental, the mental kind of comes along with that. So if I'm, if I'm, you know, kind of not stuck, but I'm not up to speed, I always start with physical first, whether it's taking a walk, doing some kind of exercise. And I try to maintain a pretty, a pretty rigid schedule as, as much as possible, um, just because it, it makes everything better. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he wrote a, he wrote a issue of his newsletter that he, he <clears throat> it was a step-by-step -step how to start every day for the rest of your life. And he had a routine that he did. And um, that's another big one. That is having a routine. The more you have a, a routine, and I'll tell you what mine is in a second. Yeah. If you have a routine, you'll just get more done. Yeah. And basically mine these days is I get up, I drink coffee. I go, there's a little coffee shop that's quiet across from my uh, place i go there and read for 30 minutes to an hour yep. drink more coffee uh <laughs> and then i work i either go to the gym or work this goes back and forth and i haven't figured out this this equation yet to where what's better to work first or go to the gym first so i kind of switch back and forth i'll either go work out and then work or work and then work out um but that's kind of my routine and then maybe I take a break in the middle of the day, go do normal human stuff or whatever. <laughs> and uh, then if I've got more stuff to do in the evening, I'll work some more. So what um what is a big criticism that Gary gave you that has been most impactful? Criticism? Yeah, like when you were working alongside him. Was there any yeah, big... I'll give you a specific example. Yeah. Um, when I first started working with him, this was 1998 and I, well, this is part of the story where I met with him and I, and I started working with him, but he got a job to write for, to write a promo for a new health newsletter. And there were, it needed premiums, free bonus reports, which if you know anything about the newsletter business, that's the whole thing it runs on. And that's how you sell the newsletter basically. And that he gave me the job and I came up with 11 different premiums. I wrote that piece of the copy for the sales letter, but then I had to write all the premiums as well, mm -hmm. which is something I don't write content anymore. I had I've rarely done that over the years, just some, uh, but I did for this and it was the first job he ever gave me. And what happened is during this period, we were in Miami beach living on ocean drive, you know, the glamor capital, <laughs> whatever. Right. And, uh, we, we moved to Marathon in the Keys, which is about the middle Florida Keys. And then a hurricane came, which is Hurricane George. And just, it's category four. It comes right through Marathon. Mm. We barely get out of there. Like, we have to take, I go to the airport. Uh, there, there are no more planes out. There are no rental cars. 
and they, they have Greyhound buses that are evacuating the Keys. Wow. And we get on one of the last buses and get out of there. And then we get to Miami. We got to rent a car. <laughs> it's just a whole big, long deal. We go to Okeechobee, Florida, where the big lake is. Wow. And uh, so long story short with that is we're out of Marathon for about 10 days. Well, my deadline's coming up, and I hadn't started working on those promos. I couldn't. Right. There was no There was no way... And, and, and actually Gary held me back from doing it. I, there were, I wanted to start because I was like, man, this is doing, you know, X amount of days or X amount of weeks. And, you know, there are 11 of these things, right? all the research, you know, they can't be fluff. And, uh, so we finally get back to marathon and he puts me in the rainbow bin hotel down there, motel actually. And I'm down there with the FEMA guys <laughs> who are parked there in an RV doing all the damage assessment from the hurricane. Uh -huh. And I start writing on those reports and, and I just wrote day and night and did nothing else. But he pushed me on that. And he, you know, he, all the way through and all the way to the end, which if anyone listening to this knows Gary or has ever worked with him, you know, that's, that's how it works. <laughs> and he's like, you know, you can do more of these. And then finally it got down to the last three, which I finished in a single day. And he was right. You know, he pushed me to uh, write faster mm -hmm. uh, and he, he was, he was right about that. So, you know, that was a piece of criticism. It's like, you know, taking too much time for things and just, instead of just knocking them out. Mm -hmm. So Scott, what's one thing the audience can do right now to get more results for their their sales copy or for you know some something they're sending out to their customers. Well, I mean that's that's kind of a hard question. Uh, I only ask the hard questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, every situation is, is a little bit different. It, it just depends. You know, the the main thing that comes to mind is improve your offer. Okay. Uh, and then after improving your offer or your deal is better headlines. Yeah. Become, become, you know, a better headline writer. And then, you know, from there, <clears throat> you, you know, making sure your stuff flows and sounds good, which the big part of that. And I know this people tell this all the time or, or give this advice all the time, but is reading your stuff out loud mm. after you're done, preferably a few times. And I can tell you, I don't know, this is like my 17th or 18th years as a freelancer. And there's, if I read something out loud, which I always do, because no matter how smooth it sounds in my head when I'm reading it, and I go, you know, I probably read a piece 20 times as I'm working on it over and over. And then I'll read it out loud and I'll make dozens of changes still yet. Uh, it's never, you can't duplicate that in your head. Right. That just improves your flow. It improves the readability. Uh, and, and it only takes, you know, well, it takes a little bit of time, but it's especially with emails and short things like that landing pages or whatever you're doing. Uh, there's no reason not to do that. Yeah. Uh, and you're selling yourself or you're cutting yourself short if you don't. You mentioned two things off the top, like right away, which was the headlines and improving your offer. What was um, something that you remember that you wrote? You wrote an offer and then you maybe you didn't think it could be improved on or maybe you were giving advice to someone else and you came up with something even better. What were a couple example offers that uh, you can share with us? Well, I'll, tell, I'll give you a, a quick story. I was writing for a PR guru. I could probably say his name. Well, if you can, I don't edit it. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll leave his name out of his good guy, okay. nice guy. He, he at one time, and this is around the year 2000 or something, I lived in Los Angeles and he hired about six or seven copywriters to beat his control. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, it was actually just a postcard, but he had good success with it uh, that led into his full PR system. And probably people realize who he is before I get done with this story. So I rewrote or I wrote a new postcard and I did one thing is I added a free video in the PS to the offer. Hmm. And so what happened is I ended up tied with the guy or essentially tied, but the guy didn't think to put anything else or approve the offer in there. And the PR guy 
tested against me. And he actually, once, once the video was inserted into his, I got beat. Um, and he never hired me again. But I, I always thought that was kind of crazy. It's like I was the only one of six or seven that had the thought to improve the offer. Um, and even though I got beat, I don't think it, it wasn't a huge margin. And I, I think I would rather have the guy that was, you know, thinking about <laughs> improving the offer and, and bumping up results a little more than, than I don't know. Uh, so that kind of sticks out. Yeah, yeah. Proving the offer helped. And then I, I got beat by my own idea. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. a good thing. What were some yeah, amazing I mean, offers you've seen? Either you wrote or other people that you were impressed with. Um. There was one a while back, and I'm not going to mention the name on this. This is for a Forex trading system. And the guy who's associated with, uh, I can say the company, Agora. And he wrote a really good uh, offer and uh, piece for that. And I, I, I don't know how to tell you what was good about it. It, it was just um, the way he reframed it and, and everything. Just made it a really good. That's one that sticks out in my head. Mm -hmm. And then, what about headlines? You mentioned headlines, improving offers, and then headlines too. What are some of your favorite headlines? Um, you know, I I like, and I, I'm biased here. Uh, I like a lot of Halberts. You know, mm -hmm. uh, how to collect money from social Social Security at any age. Um, how to? I think he wrote how to rob a bank without a gun or how to, how to legally rob a bank, something that I can't remember it verbatim. Right. And of course, a lot of Carlton's like the, the, uh, and I, I'm friends with John and, and I coach in his simple writing system and all that good stuff. So I'm biased here too, but, uh, not without good reason. John, John's, you know, the tops, uh, you know, his, his hooks, like the amazing secret of a one-legged golfer. Yes. Um, how a skinny, Little golf genius, genius started accidentally hitting 425 yard tee shots. You know those are those are just fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you can't go wrong looking at either one of those. Gary was really good at succinct. Gary was really good at knowing exactly what the audience wanted to hear, mm -hmm. and he didn't write long. I mean, he did sometimes. I, I think the the oh, I wish I had it in front of me. Uh, there was one that he collaborated on with John for, for self-defense was uh, about giving you a free gun and to prove that this guy could take it away from you as easy as, you know, you can take me away from a baby. Uh, so Gary, Gary was really good conceptually um, for sure. What about your favorite, some of your favorite personal headlines? Oh, personal ones? Yeah. Um, I had one one time. That I wrote for Joe Polish for his Genius Network. Hang on a second. Yeah. I mean, this is an interview with you, so you're allowed to be biased. You know, <laughs> so I, I want to hear your favorite, your your own favorites too. You know, I truthfully I have no favorites other than I like them because they made money. Right. Well, exactly. <laughs> so, that I guess maybe I should rephrase that question, which is not your favorites. Which headlines made the most money? But there's a lot of more components to to it, obviously, than the headline. Sure. I guess that gets while you're looking that up. So just for, for people, what components, you know, you mentioned the offer, you mentioned the headlines. What other components should people are must have that people need to have in their throughout their copy? Because you sell, you know, obviously your next for high ticket items. So you have to make sure I'm sure everything is in there. Yeah, you, you can't leave anything out. Um, yeah. So what are some of the components that you need to include? Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> in importance, A, you've got to have a great story. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's super important, though, and a lot of people miss out on that. Um, and that's where the hook idea comes in, because when you have a great hook like John has in, a lot, in almost all his headlines, you know, when he says, amazing secret of one-legged golfer, He's got a huge story to tell, right. a human interest story that's all in, in what, and this is paraphrasing him, it's almost unbelievable, right. but it's, 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 you, if you back it up immediately or soon in the copy and tell, you know, and tell the story, um, you know, you've got them. So there, right. hence, that's a hook. Right. So great stories mm -hmm. are, 
are super important. Mm -hmm. You know, and just a kind of a tangent off that. And John talks about this as well. It's, it's, you should go through your life and you should collect stories. You know, everything that happens to you is a potential story. Right. The more you do, if you, if you're a copywriter or if you're, if you're a business owner, entrepreneur writing for your own company, the more you collect stories, nothing is, is too mundane. Well, that's not true. There's a lot of stuff that's too <laughs> Went to Denny's, had a grand slam, old lady dropped her glass of water, you know, that, that's, you know, whatever. Uh, but, uh, you know, you collect stories and I, and I've, I've inserted stories. In fact, I went down to work with a guy in Florida and I used the whole story of, of how, and this is true too. I drove because I took an extended vacation. This is like 2008. And I drove because I, I rented a car and I drove 5,000 some miles total eventually. Huh. Well, the whole way, until about a hundred miles from home, I the the vents on the car, they wouldn't I couldn't get them to blow on me just right. They either were on me or off of me, and it was either too hot or too cold. This is summertime. Right. And I was all over the south, including I stayed in Key West for 10 days. Well, about a hundred miles from home, I figured out that the vents rotate 360 degrees. I was just trying to push them up and down like the old vents in right. the cars yeah <laughs> i did it, and what happened is i reached up there to push it down again because i was freezing or something and i hit it and it spun and i was just like i can't believe this you know <laughs> and the analogy i used in the way i made this tie into the copy it was for a uh, a program that would tell you your strengths and weaknesses how you were things like that and i said you know i would have gladly paid 500 bucks to have that knowledge at the beginning, the beginning of my journey, it would have made everything so much better. Mm -hmm. Just as if you know what your strengths and weaknesses are, whatever you go into, you're going to be that, you know, you're going to be way ahead of the game. You'll know what you can, can't do, or will or won't do. And that's, that's how I worked it into the copy. It was just a, it's just a story from right. And a true story, you know, and how stupid I felt after driving on, you know, 5,000 plus miles and, you know, either freezing or burning up the whole way. Yeah, and people love stories. Yeah, and especially you know that's that's another uh, that brings something up. That's like a damaging admission too. It's not a, and when you know because you know I'm I'm making fun of myself more or less for being dumb, hmm. but it's it's not related to the product or, or how well the product works or anything like that. Um, but when when you have damaging admissions like that that are small, not fatal ones, like you know I did this and you know. Uh, my house fell over, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Right. If you're selling somebody, you know, uh, remodel or something. Right. They you, will not buy from you. Yeah, it can't be fatal. But you know, if you can, if you can have small damaging admissions, it just makes everything else you say from then on more believable. Right. Right. And people, uh, you know, they have to believe to buy. Yes. I was just reading a book or listening to a book about this and they talked about Listerine, this exact example, and they admitted it tastes horrible, you know, and uh, there are things like that. And yeah. I, I don't have them off the top of my head, but where they just spun whatever was bad about it into, you know, this is terrible, but right. here's the good stuff about it. Right. That's exactly what they did. This terrible tasting zone must kill all the germs and stuff in your mouth. If it's that bad. <laughs> and it's, tr I still use Listerine because it does work. I mean, it, it, you can't get your mouth any cleaner. It's like paint thinner. <laughs> um, so we have to include a great story. What else? Good story. Uh, I know you do this stuff naturally. So. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you ingrain it after a while. Yeah. You know, and I, I mentioned I was teaching in a simple writing system, and and John has a really good. It's a seventeen step process, but after you do this long enough, that just becomes internal. So right. it's it's a little bit hard to articulate, but obviously, good story. Um, I, I spend a good amount of time on bullets, mm -hmm. and include a lot of them in my sales pieces. Mm -hmm. Proof is huge. Uh, there's there's no much there there's no such thing as as too much proof really mm -hmm. 
as long as it's interesting. I mean, you, you can't just bore people with, and so-and-so said, and you know, and such and such, and, you know, after a while. But, you know, anytime you write a statement, um, and this was kind of a, a, a little bit of a thing I got in my career. I was going along, and I got some advice from a guy who's uh, extremely sharp. And, you know, he's he said, you know, you should, anytime you make a claim, just go through your piece and look, and every time there's a claim, just write proof there and figure out, figure out a way to prove it either, either through uh, third party testimonial <clears throat> or case study, hmm. Jay Abraham. And in fact, he mentioned this to me. He's like, look at how Jay does it. And Jay is extremely good about proving what he's saying with a case study that you can't, you know, after you get done reading it, you're like, wow, you know, that's, you can't just, you have to believe it. Yeah. Type of thing. And he, he's really, when he's on and he's writing the copy, which is less and less these days and has been for a long time, but he, he, he puts out some tremendous pieces that from first glance, I mean, and for me, I was like, this doesn't look that good. But if I, if I read them, I'm like, man, this is really good. Uh, mm -hmm. because there's nothing that's unsubstantiated and he, he makes some of the best offers out there. A lot of times he'll do free preview materials for b before his seminars, before you even pay uh, good at offers too. irresistible offers, you know, in a, in a lot of ways. So great stories, bullets, headlines. You have to have a, obviously a great offer. What other components are must haves? Um, don't, shortcut the closing part mm -hmm. and the guarantee part so what do you mean by closing part well where you where you get into the offer and you know a lot of people fall down in, in that area and somebody else and i can't remember who it is he, he called it dramatizing the guarantee mm -hmm. and instead of just saying hey if you don't like this i'll give you your money back which is the bland you know easy way out um, just you're tired at the end of the piece and you're like, oh, I'm just going to throw in my guarantee and, you know, and that's that. Mm -hmm. Instead, you, you take a piece and say, you know, you know, pick up the phone, have your credit card ready, order. When it arrives, you know, open the package, put, you know, put this to use in your life. Start, you know, start with this, start with that. And, then, you know, and you go all down through this. And then when you get through with it and then, you know, and then if it doesn't work for any reason or no reason at all, you know, send it back. I, I don't, I don't want your, I don't want your money. If, if, if for whatever reason, this hasn't worked for you, like it has 10,944 others. And, you know, you, you, you just work at the close. Uh, Halbert was real good about that. And he talked about it a lot. <clears throat> he would tell people exactly what to do. And he's like, he, he's he, in his point with that was you can't, uh, you can't be too specific. I mean, you need to tell them, pick up a pencil, write, you know, get a piece of paper, write your name and address. And you won't see this as much anymore because things have switched more online. <clears throat> still the same thing, you know, enter yeah, your it's, email, it's, it's the same thing. you know, click this link, fill out your name and address. Right. Um, you know, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. You know, make sure it, well, another example, if you went to online was, you know, make sure you, you've whitelisted my email address. So you'll get, you know, check your spam, filter or your spam folder in case it doesn't come through, you know, you tell them exactly what to do. Right. And he put a great deal of em emphasis on that. Um, so, you know, falling down at the end of your piece is, is a big mistake. And especially after you've spent so much time on the rest of it. Right. Uh, what do you recommend for guarantees? Like what have you seen that's worked really well that people should be using for guarantees? Uh, the best one ever is, uh, send no money or, 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 you know, I send a, send a check, a post dated check, or I won't charge you for 30 days until you've had a chance to, to try out everything. Um, that's probably, you know, if you go back to Joe Carbo's, the lazy man's way to riches and you read that at it, which I just did recently, uh, last week. And, you know, it's almost irresistible when you get to the end. He's like, look, I, I, I don't even want any money in fact. You know, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what he said. Yeah. It's it's worth listening to. Why were you reading it? Just to brush up on something or what? Actually, for a current project. Okay. Um, I had an idea, and I, I wanted to refresh myself on what he did. And, it, and it's totally unrelated to, to what I'm talking about now, but 
It's just something he did in the, right. that I think will fit. And, I, and I'm not talking about stealing something verbatim. It's just the idea of what he did. Right. Like you know, looking at what he did with the guarantee or some other component. Exactly. So what should people look up if they want to follow along with you? If you can find a copy of Joe Carbo's The Lazy Man's Way to Riches, or if you have it on your computer, you can look at it. But uh, mm -hmm. let me see where the part I want to read to you. Yeah. Okay, and he even says this up front, which breaks. It's in the first column of uh, copy, and there are three columns. And remind me, I'll, I'll tell you another deal about this. Go ahead. Um, so here's what he says. <laughs> he even tells you, I'll even, I'm going to start a little bit sooner. Yeah, go ahead. You know, this, the second line is, well, I'll just start from the beginning. I used to work hard, the 18-hour days, the seven-day weeks. But I didn't start making big money until I did less, a lot less. For example, this ad took about two hours to write. With a little luck, it should earn me fifty, maybe a hundred thousand dollars. That's a huge no-no in copywriting, telling people what you're going to make off of them. Uh, what's more, I'm going to ask you. This is, in general, it is. So trust me, this thing is a huge winner. So it's obviously not true all the time. Right. What's more, I'm going to ask you to send me ten dollars for something that'll cost me no more than fifty cents. You'll never be told to do that by anybody. Uh, and I'll try to make it so so irresistible that you'd be a darn fool not to try it. After all, why should you care if I make $9.50 in profit if I can show you how to make a lot more? What if I'm so sure that you will make money my lazy man's way that I'll make you the world's most unusual guarantee? And here it is. I won't even cash your check or money order for 31 days after I've sent you my material. That'll give you plenty of time to, look at, to get it, look it over, try it out. If you don't agree that it's worth at least 100 times what you invested, Send it back. Your uncashed check or money order will be put in the return mail. The only reason I won't send it to you and bill you or send it COD is because both these methods involve more time and money. And I'm already going to give you the biggest bargain of your life. And I mean, that's just a great, uh, it breaks all kinds of rules. It's up front. He's, he didn't even start with a story or anything or didn't, didn't start with, uh, well, he did say if I, if, if I can show you how to make a lot more, that's the only benefit he's gotten there. And it's about five paragraphs in. Right. So uh, anyway, as far as guarantees, you know, that's just a killer. Right. And then he also has a sworn statement in here from his accountant, accountant for proof. But this, the story I was going to tell you is this thing ran something like three times a week, full page ad in, in the Los Angeles times profitably. Uh, and even in, in Halbert, Gary, he was friends with Joe Carver. And he was, he, he told me this personally, and I think he's missed it for me. He goes, you know, I was never able to, I, I wrote ones that did as well or close to it, but I was never to, to able to write one that could run that consistently in a major newspaper like that over and over and over. And this thing sold almost 4 million books and all that good stuff. Wow. So Scott, uh, so we have, you know, a great story. You know, maybe a damaging omission, bullet points, guarantee, dramatization, improve your offer, headlines, anything else that people need to make sure that they include in their copy. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer, you know, as much as you need. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a good PS, of course, or, or multiple PSs, mm -hmm. which is proven to work. Mm -hmm. uh, whether, you you know, you reiterate. The, what they're going to get, bonuses or, or uh, benefits, um, add a new element. There, you know, there are all kinds of roles for good PSs. Mm -hmm. So, Scott, how did you get started in copywriting? I was going to school at uh, Oklahoma. I'm from Oklahoma, by okay. the way, but now I live in Las Vegas. You know that. I don't think the listeners do. Yes. Uh, but I've moved all over. I lived in Florida a lot, uh, Los Angeles, Texas. But... I started in like 96. I was studying at Oklahoma State University to be a marketing major, or at least that's what I finally decided on. And I had a, a friend I lived with who was ahead of me like a year or two. And I saw what he was looking at. And I kept seeing, I, I saw an infomercial about direct marketing. 
So I, I ordered it because I was just, it just business opportunity, basically. Okay. So I was just curious because I kept seeing this thing over and over. I was like, you know, I'll look at that. And then I, as I always do with things, I started going deeper and deeper and started finding the real direct marketers that were, that were really doing it. And I kept running across the name Gary Halbert, mm-hmm. but he was not really around. He kind of had a, a hiatus for a few years in the nineties and he was just really good. So how did you find that? I mean, cause these are the people behind the people. How do you even, when you went deeper, how did you find the people who wrote these, uh, did the direct response marketing? Well, you know, I, I don't know exactly how to tell you how I did it. It's, it's just one thing led to another and I would pick up on it. I would, I would get a product or something that was a real general biz op thing and, you know, they would you you would hear a mention of this guy or that guy or, and in fact, I I found Dan Kennedy first to to tell you the truth about this. Uh-huh. Kennedy had a book in the bookstores, and he and he still does, but it's a little bit different. His No BS Book series. Yes. The first one he ever had in the bookstores had a huge long title. I can't even remember. Most of them have really long titles. Yeah, yeah, but it's kind of disguised now. They've got it to where the graphics it just says No BS Business. Yes. Then it'll it'll have a subhead. You know. Uh, Small for, businesses who are on this street. Who, or whatever it is. Yes. This one just had a big ass long title. <laughs> uh, like the almost the whole cover. And I have it in storage somewhere. Um, but I read that. And, and that was one of the first guys that really made, that rang true to me. Yeah. What he was saying was like, wow. You know, and I read it in an hour or something or two hours. It was a small book. Right. But he mentioned Halbert several times in that. And I and and I kind of thought, you know, I keep hearing this guy Halbert. Is that book still out? I mean, the one that you got way back when. Is, well, is it's it? it's now the newly updated on I gotcha. press version. Gotcha. Uh, but you know, it'll still say a lot of probably a lot of the same things. You could probably find a used copy. Yeah. This is about ninety seven. Yeah. So if, if you looked around, and you'll see, Dan's got like a long hair and <laughs> all kinds of stuff, and uh, and you'll 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 recognize it because, like I said, the, the the title is the whole cover and they fought him on that, by the way, I've heard him tell the story in seminars and, and on tape that, you know, they did not want to do that, but, uh, right. you know, he's the he, expert. Yeah. I mean, it, it worked and he didn't listen, which is, that's another piece of advice. If, you, if I, I, I think this comes from Earl Nightingale or something, if you want to be successful, find out what everybody's doing and do the opposite, right. you know, uh, which a lot of times is very true. But anyway, so I, and he mentioned Halbert in there two or three times. So finally I'm like, you know, I need to figure out who this guy is. Cause I keep hearing this, you know, he's, he's written the most widely sell, uh, mailed sales letter in history or one of the most, uh, there's some controversy whether the, the wall street journal ones meld more and maybe it has, but whatever, Yeah. Uh, you know, no single person's written a letter like he has that's mailed that many times. And what I mean, single person, not a big corporation like the wall street journal. Plus, I would like to see their profit numbers, you know, on that. I, I don't know. Right. Anyway, uh, so, and I don't know how I, I think maybe he gave an address to his off to Gary's office. So I wrote a letter saying, hey, you know, I'd just like some products or, to subscribe to the Gary Halbert letter. And it was a long time. I say a long time. It seemed like a long time. Four, five, six weeks. And I got a fax back. And it was an ad for Max Money. And if you signed up for the Gary Halbert letter, you got Gary's book, How to Make Maximum Money in Minimum Time for free. So I did that. And you were then, in college at the time. I, by then, yeah, I'm skipping over some things. I apologize. No, by no. then, I had made up my mind to become a direct marketer. Yeah. Because I'll tell you one thing. I did get good out of college. The marketing stuff was nonsense. I went to like two marketing meetings. It was just, it was nonsense. And I decided, and I, and, and, well, and I'll tell you, I'm skipping over, I haven't told Good. this all the time, yeah. but one of my assignments was to meet, as you, you know, you get your major, you go and meet with the, one of the heads of the uh, department, right. right, psychology. So I get a vice president of marketing at the university, and he's all dressed up and, you know, his clothes are perfectly pressed. And he, you know, he does the usual interview stuff. It's like, why do you want to be in marketing? Why do you, I said, you know, I'd like to learn it. This is before I knew what they were teaching wasn't any good. Um, I would like to learn it so I could have my own direct marketing business. Yeah. And he kind of sat back and grinned and smirked at me. He's like, well, you know, you, you got to, uh, you got to, 
you graduate first and foremost, and then you, you're going to have to go to work as an intern, and you're going to have to work in a, and then get and try to get a job in an agency and work your way up for about 10 years. And then you're going to, you know, and, and he just laid out this plan of like 20 years of crap. <laughs> and I knew he was, he was, excuse my language, just full of shit. Right. I knew all these little entrepreneur guys were making multi millions in direct marketing, and none of them had a degree. None of them did that. So right then and there, I didn't quit right away. I didn't quit college right away, but I had made up my mind. I was like, this guy's just full of it. And, you know, I'm not going to listen to that, mm-hmm. which is kind of one of my traits. I'm kind of hard headed <laughs> and rebellious. But I think everybody in this business has a little bit of that. Right. Well, they probably wouldn't be in it. But, uh, and I, you know, within about a semester, I, I left and started trying to run projects uh, on my own. Mm-hmm. And I went through, a year or two of that, you know, and I would, I would lose money left and right. What were you doing? What were you testing? I just tried everything. I tried reprint rights, selling advertising, but you know, the typical business opportunity yeah. arc or bell curve of what you do when you get into that field mm-hmm. <laughs> and you, you end up losing a lot of money, I, but I learned stuff and I, you know, and I eventually started my advertising. I was writing, uh, started making a little bit of money here and there and That's And then I just kept working towards getting to the really core direct marketing guys. And that's, that was just a process that took time. Uh, Another thing I will say that I don't want to leave out is the the college had a fantastic library for all I know it still does. And they had all the classic books. I mean, almost all of them. So what I did in my. So what do you consider the class for people out there? What do you consider some of the classic books? Well, First and foremost, you know, Claude Hopkins, Scientific Advertising, and also My Life in Advertising. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all the Cables books, uh, Tested Advertising Methods, which up to the fourth edition, the fifth edition, got handed over to a uh, agency guy, and he just killed it with bad examples. Um, how, to, how, to, how to Make Your Advertising Make Money, that's a Cables book. Um, Making Ads Pay, another great Cables book. So you can't go wrong with anything with John Cables. Mm-hmm. In fact, you not only go wrong, you should be shot if you haven't read this. <laughs> uh, the Robert Collier Letter Book, mm-hmm. uh, which is now easily available again. That's that's priceless. Let's see what else. How, how to Write a Good Advertisement or Advertisement by Vic Schwab. Um, I probably have a list here somewhere. <laughs> I think that will keep people busy for a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you'll you'll get you'll get onto this, and you'll you'll see, you know, the rest of them. But there are good um, eight or ten books. In fact, let me just look at something real quick. So at this point, so did you decide to not finish college after hearing this yeah. guy's advice? Yeah, I I just I. Well, I went to college later on in life. That's that's another thing you should know. I didn't go to college until I was 25. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I worked crap jobs, factory jobs, mowed grass, did, did manual labor. And it, that's probably like maybe the biggest. It's almost like being a weakling and starting powerlifting because you didn't want to be a weakling anymore. Um, I didn't want to work in a factory anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, And I would do anything in the world not to have to do that. Right. Uh, it, it was just sheer torture. Working in the factory? Yeah, working factory. Any kind of manual labor. Why, what was it like? Uh, it, every day was, uh, in fact, I worked in a fiberglass pipe plant. I remember I had a a, uh, <laughs> a Bob Seger Greatest Hits tape, and I would be listening to that just for whatever reason. It was in my player cassette tape. That's how long ago this was. <laughs> and, uh, and he had a song, something about working hard, and I used to just listen to that, and I was like, this is so depressing. <laughs> You get up at five in the morning, it's freezing cold outside in the winter. You go to work in a place where you sweat all day. You you know, your feet hurt when you, I, I just don't like manual labor. That's yeah. just all it's to it. It and makes that's you appreciate it. You when you're a high school graduate, right. you come from a, you know, a working class community. Yeah. Uh, and it just wasn't for me. I mean, it makes you appreciate though, and drove you to do something else. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, I didn't know what it was and didn't find it for several years until the direct marketing thing hit and, and the bug hit me. And I was like, this is it. This is the greatest thing in the world. Mm-hmm. I can use my mind. 
I don't have to get up when it, that was always a big one too. I hated school. I hated getting up for school. I hated the prison like aspect of it, not college. That was way different. I actually enjoyed my college experience. I didn't quit because it wasn't, you know, I didn't have good times. It just, I, I wanted to do something else right? Um, and knew what it was finally for the first time. In my right. Life. So it was just kind of an epiphany type deal. Scott, um, what was your first big turning point with copy? Your first big win that you had? Because you said, obviously, you tried a lot of stuff in the beginning. You're just learning and practicing. What was the first big win you had? Well, the first big win um, wasn't actually writing to consumers. And and I, I cut the story off. But what I did with Gary mm-hmm. is I wrote, I sat down and wrote him a handwritten letter and just to, and told him my story and said, look, you know, and all I did at the end, I wished I still had this. And he had it when I was down there at first. And I should have uh, stole it from him and saved it yeah. <laughs> because it just went away and all the moving around. And, yeah. uh, but it was about five pages of a handwritten letter because I didn't even have a computer at the time. I had a typewriter, but I'm not a good enough typist, even with carbon paper and whiteout, to put together a coherent type. So much easier to handwrite. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God for you know word processors now, but uh, or computers or whatever you want to call it. But uh, I wrote him a letter, and I said, "Look, you know, all I want is 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 your products, and you know, I'll even drive down to Florida to to get them if I have to, whatever you know, whatever it takes." And I included a gift, which was a. a a newly re-released Jimmy Buffett. Cause I knew he liked Jimmy Buffett. I did too. This had nothing. I wasn't trying to suck up to him, but it was a really cool re-release CD from a 1975 movie mm-hmm. called Rancho Deluxe. Mm-hmm. And I sent that to him. I FedExed it to him. And you were serious. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, and at the, at that time I was back working manual labor. Yay. <laughs> I was doing trim carpentry, which is just a little bit less, or a little bit better than doing, you know, framing houses. At least you're inside out of the sun, but it right. still sucks. And I was doing that because I just had to do something and it was easily available to me. So, you know, a terrible job, summertime. And I didn't expect anything out of that letter, but about eh, another five, six weeks goes by. And I came home one day and I was staying with my brother actually. And, and, and he's like, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a message. This is still when you had, you know, message machines instead of voicemail. He's like, there's a message from Gary Halbrun, the, the And I thought he was just jacking with me because I'd been talking about it. He was like, he was to the point of making fun of me about it. Like, yeah, sure, you're going to do this or that. Uh, which, by the way, that's a piece of advice for anyone is is just ignore the naysayers because mm-hmm. they're always, and they'll be your family, your friends. Nobody wants to, you know secretly most people don't like to see you succeed and the only way you can win that game is by succeeding right so uh, i had that in spades in my life because nobody had ever you know done anything besides go to work in a factory or something like that Mm -hmm. yeah when you change the the norm people don't like that yeah i was way outside the the paradigm for my uh clan or whatever (laughs) so um I checked the machine. It just, you know, I did anyway, even though I thought he was just messing with me. And sure enough, it was Gary Halbert. And so I called him back and he said, look, you can come down here, stop in Ocala where my assistant Teresa is and get products. And, um, you know, just come down here and hang out for a week or something like that. But here, you got to do one thing. He started telling me, he's, he's like, you got to go through Oklahoma city and, uh, visit this model <laughs> that he knew from and all and it's this is typical Gary Howard stuff. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sure. And a I, model? I, yeah. Like a person, like a female model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh no, I I'm sorry. I, I got that wrong. That was the original suggestion. But then he said, no, you gotta he goes, well I'll tell you what, as soon as we got the phone, call her and tell her Gary said hi. So that's what I we got down to on that. And I did that. Okay. And this was this is like a Friday and I immediately quit my job, rented a car, and was gone Monday morning. I didn't even think twice about it. You know, I don't feel good about quitting on somebody, you know, but it, it was a nowhere situation anyway. I right. didn't belong there. 
I wasn't that good at it, first of all. I, and I don't know how much help I was to the guy. And it was just better all the way around. So I went to Florida. He gave me a couple of jobs the first week, uh, one of them being writing that piece of copy for the, the premiums I mentioned earlier, that section of the sales letter. Right. And he he offered me, you know, he said, hey, why don't you stick around? And I become I became one of uh, his famous or infamous road dogs, okay. which I shared with like John Carlton and some other people. And so that was, that was, so, you know, that's the biggest win in my life. Yeah. That's it, without that, I would probably still be in this business. Uh, but in a way, I, you know, I, I don't know where I would be. Uh, I would, it would, I'd probably be doing it for a living, but in my life that completely turned my life around. Right. Obviously, So that's the biggest winner I've got by far. What about, um, so what were some of the gems, you know, what do you mean by road dog? Road dog, um, <laughs> and if, if and, and Carlton tells this story better than I can a lot, uh, but what you do basically is you you drive around with Gary and go run errands and and, and just do whatever you know is is on the list of things to do. None of which a lot of times involve actually doing any marketing or writing advertising, and oftentimes it's dangerous. Dangerous? <laughs> yeah. Like literally dangerous. I one time he sent me when when we left Miami Beach <sighs> to go to Marathon, he left his cats with the maid, Cuban maid. You know, Cuban South Florida is, is or especially Miami Dade County is, is largely Cuban. And uh, after about a month, when we finally got settled, he's like, Go get my cats. I was like, All right. So I go to the maid's condo. She lives in a condo, which is kind of odd and a nice one too for a maid, but whatever. <laughs> and she had subletted the cats out to another Cuban family, which did not live in a nice condo. In fact, a really shady area of Miami Beach. I get there, there's like 12 people in this one room apartment. Oh my God. The cats don't want to come with me. None of them hardly speak any English. And they're just looking at me like we, you know, I felt like, you know, they were thinking, you know, they could they could kill me and shove me under the mat. <laughs> Nobody would ever know. Uh, so, yeah, oftentimes dangerous even, you know. So, I mean, you must be a pretty big guy. Like, well, yeah, it, it, you know, but you can't, you know, if somebody wants to shoot you while your back's turned, you can't do much about that. Right. <laughs> and they, they did not look happy for me to be there. Uh, I can tell you that. But yeah, I got the cats. The it's dangerous day. being a copywriter. <laughs> Around Gary, of course, yeah. just one of a jillion. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of off a little bit right now. I can't remember some other stuff, but uh, that's just one of many, many stories like that. And what we did, though, and what was super valuable is this whole time we would drive around, you know, I would take Gary to the doctor and we'd just we would do stuff like that. And then occasionally we would stop and write a promotion. Mm -hmm. But what was really valuable about that is I literally spent... And I don't think I'm exaggerating here, you know, thousands of hours in conversation with him, talking about marketing, talking about mindset, uh, learning, you know, history and, and all this stuff. And that was invaluable because the mindset, you know, is as much. And then he would grill me on stuff, you yeah. know, relentlessly. So that kind of training, you can't buy that hardly. So Tell that, me about the mindset. What about the mindset? Well, just, you know, how, how to think to sell, um, what's important about selling, what's, what's the most important things and, and, and all that that goes into it, how to, how to think about the writing process, uh, psychology, psychology of different groups, all that stuff. I mean, I, I don't know how to give you a specific yeah. example, but, uh, you know, and it's, it's, and I would pick up little gems. Like he once told me, he's like, you know what the number one reason why people buy you know, or you just asked me, well, you know, what, what do you think the number one reason why people buy is? Mm -hmm. And I said, self-interest, because you'll read that a lot. And that's largely true. But he said, that's not it. It's, it's curiosity above all things else, hmm. all, all, you know, all other things. Yeah. So that was a gem I picked up. I mean, I picked up lots of little gems like that. And I wish I, off the top of my head, like, like I said, you internalize this stuff after a while and it just yeah. pops out while you're working. Right. Uh, but that, you know, that was, that was invaluable. So Scott, what about, um, you know, I guess some of the, along the way, 
some of the big mistakes you learned a lot from when you got, I guess, at what point did you get your first um, own clients? Um, I worked with Gary off and on for, you know, the last decade of his life. Uh, but there were periods in there where I was on my own a lot. Mm -hmm. Probably in 2000, I, when I was living in Los Angeles, I went out there initially to work with Gary and his son, Bond. And by the way, before I forget, that's another book and, and that people should read is the Boron Letters. And Bond, Halbert, has re-released that uh, with his own commentary. That's a fantastic book for, for anybody to read. Yeah. But uh, so in 2000, I, I worked with them for a little bit, but it just, the project kind of, and it was nobody's fault. It just kind of faded out a little bit. So I got stuck on my own. And, you know, Southern California is a great place to be a freelancer, especially if you have contacts. I had some, but few, but I had, you know, Gary, Gary in my pocket. Uh, so that helped tremendously. And I started picking up clients just to survive in Los Angeles. So that, that was the first time I was really on my own right. away from him. Although, you know, he wrote me a letter of endorsement. I got John Carlton actually really gave me a hand up there by introducing me to a, a man named John Finn, who's, who's now passed away. Good, great guy, copywriting agent. And I worked with him some, that's how I got involved with Jay Abraham working, uh, uh, writing for him uh, and, mm -hmm. and some other, some, some other people. So that was probably the first time, like uh, 2000. But the end of that story is I spent about a year doing that. And then I went back to work with Gary. Uh, he had developed a stock trading system. And we we rolled that up and got that up to where it was really cooking. And I wrote a, uh, <clears throat> a letter and I, I finally cracked the uh, cold list market with that letter. And when I say cold list, just in case people don't know, that's mailing to mailing list where people don't know you know there are obviously good mailing lists people who bought financial products bought them recently paid you know a good amount of money all that good stuff you got to have with a good list but i cracked the code on it after about two tries and i did I, the, the last letter i wrote it took me i was in the airport marriott in my <clears throat> downtown that's not downtown miami it's in miami by the airport um and I spent like two or three hours in the afternoon and was drinking a Sam Adams at like five o'clock. And that thing in royalties paid me like 80 grand that year in 2001. Wow. I didn't, I, that's all I, like two to three hours work. And I was like, man, this is cool. Uh, and I think you asked me about mistakes, right? Yeah. Okay. So here's a mistake. If you're a freelancer or if you're a marketer uh, or, you know, direct marketer entrepreneur, I did that. I took a few jobs during the year, but I mostly just hung out, went to the Keys, drank, you know, just had a good time. Thinking that this is going to go on forever. It did not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when, when it stopped, I was woefully unprepared for it to stop. And that's a big trap. You know, you, you, you start up in your monthly nut of stuff you're buying or right. you're paying on or, you know, and, and I recovered. I, I quickly got back on my feet. In fact, I may have told that a little bit out of sequence. I wrote, the cold list letters after that, and then made money all over again. But for a while, it was a really, so now I'm, I, I don't, you know, there are no ones or I try not to let any one thing, no matter how well it's going, mm -hmm. dictate or, or, you know, it's like, Hey, this could stop tomorrow. So always be, you know, cognizant mm -hmm. of that because it, it can and will nothing lasts forever. You know, well, some things have, but whatever. <laughs> Scott, so what'd you do to crack the code? At, well, I just took two stabs at it. <laughs> uh, and I, I mean, the first one did okay, but the second one, I, you know, I probably changed it up. I probably wrote a different headline and uh, it made, I can't, uh, I don't want to exaggerate on this, but it was like 20 bucks for every dollar spent mailing. Wow. Uh, and we were able to roll it out uh, on a pretty good level. And this is for a $2,000 product, basically 2000, like 1985 or something, two mm -hmm. payments. And there was a two payment option. And, th and that went on to make it a, a good amount of money. At that time, there probably weren't that many high ticket items like that, right? Right. And yeah, it's, it's not like now where everybody has a product launch with a $2,000 product. Uh, back then, there wasn't much that, that sold for 2000 unless it was a seminar. Mm -hmm. 
you know, Gary obviously had his his seven thousand dollar seminars in Key West before that, and things like that. But n- not many info products cost two thousand bucks back then. Right, Scott. So, what are some other successful campaigns? The and why they were effective. I went to work after that, during that, and after that, with a financial client. Um, because I got kind of a reputation for writing for financial stuff, right? Which, by the way, I don't like. I, I'm not a fan of writing financial pieces, but mm-hmm. you know, you do what's offered to you sometimes, mm-hmm. and it turned out to be really lucrative. I worked with him for uh, probably eight years, wow. uh, pretty much nonstop. And, you know, we sold, he had a book that was, <clears throat> we, we sold at various prices. This is all through direct mail, by the way. We sold it at various, from 1995 to 3995. Later on, and we sold it, we sold over a million bucks worth of that book, just all by direct mail. Wow. And then later on, we tested giving it away free and I wrote a, a tear sheet ad, which if people don't know what that is. It's basically, it's a newspaper ad, but it's a it's a kind of a faux or fake newspaper mm-hmm. ad mm-hmm. with the jagged edges. And you just tear it out and mail it with a post-it note that's handwritten that says, you know, check this out. And you put an initial on it. And, it, you know, it's done a little bit to kind of make it look personal. People, a lot of people get it and realize it's not really personal, but they work. And uh, we gave it away free through that, that uh, tear sheet. And that turned out to be even way more profitable because mm-hmm. our back end was a piece of software that cost almost four four grand, thirty nine ninety five or whatever it was. Hmm. So and when you say thirty nine ninety five, you're talking three thousand. Three thousand, yeah. And a, a lot of people, a relative lot of people, took us up on that piece of software. Um, and I wrote sales letters that I, I had a lot of big hits with it. And then when the market went, you know, to hell in, in the end of two thousand eight, and all that stuff happened. What we were doing pretty much stopped working. In fact, we did a we did a big mailing that just goose egg, which was really surprising. That had never happened before. Hmm. So things changed, and then he had a, a few health problems, and uh, uh, so I, I, we just or not we stopped working together. And he went and did some things on his own. Went into some different business. Good guy. I mean, I, I in fact I need to try to get a hold of him again. It's been a long time since I've talked to him. So what can you remember from that time specifically? Why were those working? I mean, that's a high priced product to sell to direct mail. I'm yeah, sure higher well, than most, most yeah, anything. I mean, we sold all kinds of stuff. We sold, we sold coaching that was 2,855 bucks. Um, option systems. I mean, just about every Forex system. Uh, well, one thing it's, it's, and, and I, I think this is correct. Uh, that, that field or that market, the financial, when you look at comparables and, and the other people in the, they sell things at that price. It's one of the higher end kind of mm-hmm. markets in a lot of ways. So we weren't out of line with what was going on in the marketplace. Right. Yeah. So what about campaigns that didn't do well and why? Fortunately, I don't have a whole lot of those, <laughs> but I, I've written, uh, you know, I, I wrote one time I wrote a, uh, we used to run a lot of newspaper ads and we, we would do it through a lady named Nancy Jones who got discount rates. And I wrote one for a, uh, you know, how to, how to get your prescription medicines, you know, up to 90% off. And that one failed it. Maybe it broke even or something, but I was, I was really shocked about that. That's one of the ones I was shocked about because I was like, man, this is a good piece. Um, and, and the, in the, the, the other side of that is, just recently, I wrote something. Uh, well, and I, I didn't mention this. I spent the last five years writing in uh, the survival prepper market for a, for a long term client. It was originally one of Gary's clients. I've known him since two thousand. But I wrote, and this goes to show you, you never know. I I wrote a promotion for a basically a light bulb <laughs> that charged via solar. Nothing sexy about that, and came up with the hook. I think this is jointly or we worked on this together a little bit because the client's a sharp guy was the world's smallest solar generator. And I wrote that piece in maybe a day and a half because we were, I was under the gun deadline wise. And I, even when I got done, I was like, you know, I can't tell if this is any good or not. 
I think it's a piece of crap. I doubt it does anything. <laughs> Uh, and I really felt that way. I was like, I just, I just had to do it. And I had to get it done because there was a, a deadline on it. And so there was no other, there was no time to like break it down and, and try to make it any better. Or I just looked at it and went, well, it's, that's the best I can do with the time I have right. uh, available. And it ran and set a company sales record really? of all time since the beginning of the company. So, you, you know, you, you, you don't know. <laughs> uh, I was wrong. I wish I could do that every time, especially in a short amount of time. Although the stress of that's not real fun, I can tell you that. What do you do in the improvement process? You said, I, obviously, let's say you had more time. What would you have done with that? Well, the, if 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 let's let's just have a hypothetical with that. Okay, I finish it, but I get a call, and um, by the way, the deadlines move back a week for X X reason. Mm-hmm. First thing I would do is just get away from it for like two days, yeah. not even look at it. And then I would go back through it and, and, you know, read it aloud, look for things. Maybe I can improve the offer. It's all, you know, I, I always come back to offer right. because a lot of times that's the deal. Right. Improve the offer, add another bonus or bonuses, plural. Um, maybe a better headline. Um, so, you know, basically that. Yeah. Scott, what do you do? I know you coach a lot of copywriters too. What big mistakes are they making that you see are really common? Um, or what are the biggest questions you get? I'm trying to relate this to what I'm doing currently. Well, what are you doing currently? I, I'm I'm actually coaching in in a Carlton Simple Writing System right now. I'm I'm I was one of the original coaches, and I've done it about four times. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was just trying to think of what's kind of a common denominator. Yeah. Um, one thing in that, and I don't want to talk too specifically about it because it's John's deal, but I get people that get hung up. Like if we're doing something that's a USP and yeah. I. Unique I, selling proposition yes, for anyone who doesn't know. Yeah. Ross or Reeves. That's a, that's a, well, I don't know how useful that book is uh, for people to read. It's really hard to, uh, is it reason? No. I can't. Uh, never mind. Reality and advertising, I think, is the book. Um, and he talks about the invention of the USB, whatever. But uh, I'll give them an example. And maybe I won't have the exact specifics right, but I, I show them the overriding principle. But they take it really, you know, verbatim to the letter. Well, this won't work because in my situation, I'm like, no, you're not paying attention. I'm not saying this is, you know, but this is how you do it. And this is what it'll look like, whatever your specifics inserted are. Uh, so people get really hung up on being, uh, you know, if it's just not downright specific to their situation, they don't understand it. You mean if you don't give an example that's specific to their market, then they just see it for what it is instead well, of... Not even so much their market, but if it doesn't fit their story exactly, they're not able to look at it and see the overriding principle. Um, it's and, and, and I have to go back and tell them, it's like, no... I'm not saying this is because I don't know your full story, um, but here's, you know, and then I, I break it down. It's like, you need something like this, whatever your specifics, specific thing is to insert in there. And that's your job to figure that out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm not writing your letter for you. I'm just trying to show you how it's done. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's, you know, there's get hung up on that. Um, Probably just not putting enough time in uh, with headlines, things like that. And that, that comes from, you know, and I've had this conversation with other top writers and, and other people just in general. You know, with the Internet, the good and bad of it is things have become so sped up. Uh, you're expected to, you know, your jobs have sped up, mm-hmm. uh, which is a detriment. Because, you know, it's it's an email can go out tomorrow as long as you finish the copy today. Well, you never have the time. Well, I, I do now, uh, now that I'm I'm not with a long-term client anymore and I'm making my own deals. I, I, I get the time now because, I mean, that's the deal. Because, you know, <clears throat> you need time to write multiple headlines, let them set for a day, go back and look at them. So um, just the, the speed thing is, is, is a lot of times it's gotten out of hand. Mm-hmm. 
that's not specific to to what mistakes copywriters are making, but it's just everybody, you know, because things are so instant, easy, and free now. Uh, you, you know, you go and 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 we we talked about Brian Kurtz before, but he he wrote a uh, he has an e letter that's fantastic, by the way, that he just started writing, and he you know he talks about you know how in, in direct mail you would never do that because you pay postage. Right, you're paying a ton of money. It costs yeah. you a lot. So you, you better know, work at if, it. If, if a guy like Gary Benzavinga needs three months for this, he gets it. Uh, and for good reason, because then it's going to go on to mail a hundred million copies, you know? Right. Uh, so that, that's kind of, and, it, and it's really hard, especially people that have only grown up, I say grown up or come into this online right. that they don't understand that. And I guess as a freelancer, it's your job to try to explain that to them. A lot of times it falls on deaf ears, but, so, yeah, what's been, you know, obviously you've had a lot of successes. What's been a low point? Mm. I mean, there have been times I've gotten down to, uh, you know, no money uh, even, but I, I quickly recovered. That's, that's the thing, you know, um, with with this skill and that's you know that's what makes copywriting such a great skill whether you recover by your you know you recover by your own hand um so you know there's always a way out uh but i've you know i've gotten in situations where the bottom has just fallen out and and i've been stuck with nothing and i'm like wait hey you know i gotta do something so what do you do i i just start Going after you know what anybody does, uh, you you go into your your network. That's that's another you know you should have a good network of contacts, um, and you know you just start looking for work and and uh, you write your way out of it or market your way out of it the best you can. What's been a high point? One of your proudest accomplishments? I you know I I I probably just go. Back to working with Howard again. I mean, I don't think it's going to get any higher than that. Uh, as far as you know, I, I've had uh, winners with with a lot of different clients, things like that, um, and made a good living. Been able to live wherever I want, do what I want. You know, that's that's a high point. That was that's that's more in. You know, I'm not. That's that's the main thing for me is the freedom. Um, yeah. And when that starts getting taken away, if I get if you know, it gets too hectic. Uh, I would rather take less money, make less money, and have more freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the more important thing to me. I'm not saying money's not important; it obviously is, but that's not my first consideration. It's like, you know, how stressed out am I going to be uh, if I if I do, you know, if I take this extra job? And I turned down some pretty big jobs, and and I've turned down twenty and thirty thousand dollar jobs very recently because it just wasn't worth it. Mm -hmm. No, I might, you know, I'll have the extra money, but you know, it might kill me <laughs> and I'm not right, even it's too joking. stressful. Yeah. I'm not even really joking about that. It's just like, my brain's full. I can't afford to go down physically. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm doing fine. There's no reason to do this other than just sheer money grubbing. Uh, and it's going to, it's going to make my life miserable. And I right. just, you know, I turn it down. <clears throat> What's your favorite uh, genre to write for? You know, the easiest one, obviously, is <clears throat> sales, marketing, business improvement, seminars. Mm -hmm. Those are those are a snap. Uh, and I like that. I like health stuff, although I don't get to do a lot of it. But I've, I've written, I've had some pretty good health pieces. Um, that initial one was good. The, the newsletter with Gary, that ended up being sold. It was profitable. Uh, what was it? It was just a, it was a health newsletter with the premiums I wrote when I first met Gary. Yeah. That ended up being sold. The, the original guy sold it to somebody else, but it was profitable in the mail. Um, and I, I, I beat a, uh, the last time I went down to work with Gary was 2006. It was about six months before he passed away. <clears throat> Excuse me. And a, a guy had a, a real underground guy. Nobody, you, he's not a guru, but he's been quiet. He, he subscribed to the Gary Halbert letter right from the beginning and has been quietly making millions of dollars. A lot of people like that, by the way, that people don't even know. Um, but he had a colon cleanse product that had mailed 
30 plus million times over, over 17 years. Whoa. I was able, yeah, it's huge. I mean, the guy's been making a ton of money for forever. I was able to beat that control. Um, and then I never heard another thing from him. I don't know what the deal was. What did you do to beat the control? What I did, because I'll tell you, this is a pretty instructional story, I think, for people. If you go back to, uh, it's either Hopkins or, or, or Caples. I think it's Hopkins. Is you want to paint paint the positive side of the picture, mm-hmm. and obviously, what's this, positive about a colon cleanse? No, I'm yeah, just, that's I'm what just, I'm saying. Yeah. Here's, I'll tell you in a second. Uh, but you want to paint the positive side of the picture. It's like you don't want to you don't want to sell cavity pre- prevention. You want to sell white teeth, um, and obviously, just like with any rule, there are exceptions to this. But I don't, you know, and people can argue it or whatever. But in general, you know, the positive side of the picture they found through a jillion tests that they did right. when people still really tested uh, that, that it worked better. So what I did, this guy had a, his colon cleanse deal was, <clears throat> first of all, it was a, it was a little like Magalog type thing that was on newsprint, which is, that's fine. But on the front cover are pictures of like diseased colons. And I was like, man, that's just not, <laughs> you know, and this is like, this is turning me off. It's just like it was a personal thing with me. I mean, and all throughout the copy he's showing, you know, magnified images of parasites. And, you know, you, this is in your body and you just feel like crap after you read the right. it. And it does. There's no good feeling at all. So I took the completely opposite tag. And what I did, in fact, I didn't base it. His was based on. I don't know if the big benefit was just getting this stuff out of your body, basically. And, you know, um, but I based mine on, I didn't even talk about colon plans till like page three. And I based it on uh, how to, how to increase your energy, just your physical mental energy. Hmm. It was something like how to double your energy guaranteed, or it's a little bit better than that. But, and I, and then I went into a story and my story was all about, and it was, it was an interesting fact story. And you know, did you know, in fact, maybe I can look this up just the first line or two. Give me a second. Did you do a lot of research? How did you know that it increased energy? Did you just talking to him or just reading it? That was in his stuff. I mean, okay. it, it, and it will. If you get rid of the gunk in your body, you know, and and get rid of parasites, if it does indeed do that, you're going to have more energy. Mm-hmm. And he had a little piece in there, but it wasn't highlighted. Um, and then you know, I just started the letter. It's it was a, it was a headline three subheads, a subscript headline, and the letter starts, "Dear friend, <clears throat> did you know?" Did you know doctors say that low energy or tiredness is the number one most common complaint to hear from patients who come in to visit them? It's true. It has certainly been my experience during the 37 years I practiced medicine. Then I went on, and then I'll just read this whole thing because it's, it's kind yeah, of yeah. Go ahead. It's kind of uh, telling. It has certainly been my experience in the 37 years I practiced medicine, and it makes sense. The accelerated pace of life over the last 50 years, not to mention the last decade or two, has caused people to push themselves to, the, to their limits. The daily stressors have multiplied 10 to 50 fold or more. For example, let's take a quick look at how life in the 1950s compares to today. In the 1950s, there were no cell phones. And I just go into this big, long thing. I talk about the first, um, you know, computers, the ENIAC, which weighed 30 tons and was 100 long. And I, I go into this and, and it's all about stress and how it robs you of energy and, and all this stuff. I even talk about TVs, you know, and how it's gotten so ridiculous and the latest ones up. 103 inch plasma, which is not true anymore. They, that, this is almost eight years old. Um, and then I talk about, you know, the options uh, in life. They're just so much you can't even keep up. So that's all of page two. What was your original, what was the headline? Because it must have been very, much different if he's showing pictures of horrible colons and you're talking by the way i used no pictures either there were no pictures this is just a straight a pile piece of direct mail on eight and a half by 11 no pictures all text how to uh parentheses at least close parentheses double your energy levels guaranteed just a simple little headline and promise uh nothing fancy about that and i had some subheads that, that, that expand on that you know if you feel tired sleepy fatigued or just plain exhausted and, he, and you've got five minutes a day. I'll show you a guarantee. And on and on and on. Yeah. So what uh, was what was they actually selling? Colon plants. I mean, on your it's, own. It's, like, it's, is it a pill? Or? You know, it's, it's what all writers call. You know, whatever it is, it's just goop. It was, <laughs> it's a pill. 
Yeah, it's, there were pills, okay. a, a formula, a powder you take, which is like a herbal uh, uh, fiber type thing. And there was also this tea that really just, <laughs> by the way, I tried. I, uh, <laughs> I Not to be gross, but I used this product for like 10 days and I had I stopped because I literally couldn't leave the house. Uh, but it didn't work. <laughs> No, mind you, it, I mean, you, you lost weight. It worked. I just, I just got tired of being confined to my house. What was in it that made you? Do you remember? Oh well, it's, it was just a bunch of herbal things. The tea, yeah. I forget what the. T- you can buy this stuff at a health food store. Yeah. Still, uh, even though he, his was a quote unquote proprietary deal, but that that kind of tea that you take, you drink it at night, and it's available, and it's just a real strong laxative, and plus the fiber and. The, just a ton of herbs and things like yeah. that. You could what sell I, it to the wrestling market who are uh, trying to cut weight. Yeah, <laughs> I got a funny story that I can't tell on the <laughs> about wrestling in high school, uh, but I I can't tell that. It's, it's really disgusting. I mean, it, it wasn't me either. <laughs> okay, so what I'm trying to the point I'm trying to make here is I'm on page three, middle of the page, ninety. It says. Then let, and then I say, ready, let, and this is after I talk about all the stress and all that stuff. I say, ready, then let's get going. What I'm going to talk to you about is according, is according to the Royal <clears throat> Academy of Physicians in Great Britain, the cause directly or indirectly of 90% of all disease and discomfort in humans. What is this energy robbing health destroying menace? Health destroying menace? It's an unclean clogged colon. So I don't mention the colon until the middle of page yeah. three. Uh, and then I just went on to, you know, tell all the ways that that's bad and what, what happens. And it's a 16 page letter and it just closes out with, you know, order this great stuff. Right. No, that that's great. Thanks for sharing that. that. Yeah, no, no problem. I, I went completely and it's, it just so you know, it's, it's a, it was a $90 product, 89, 95. Wow. So it wasn't a cheap product. Real cheap. Not at all. Um, and I just went the, the totally other way on a hunch and knowing what I know from, you know, way back when they used to t- sell, you know, the positive, paint the positive side of the picture. So, yeah. you know, it's like, I'm not going to beat him on gross out. You should have seen this thing. It was hideous. So I was like, well, I'm just going to do this completely the opposite. If it doesn't work, I'll rewrite it, you know. But it didn't happen. It beat the control. Handy. Yeah. And Scott, you don't have to tell me exact figures, but how do people, pay, do they pay a flat fee for you to do something like that? Or do they give you typically offer royalties? What do people, what's typical or? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I do some flat fee stuff, but yeah, I always, you know, try to get, uh, royalties tried to, excuse me, royalties tied to, to performance mm-hmm. if it makes sense. Uh, because you know, it's, it's beneficial for me obviously and them as well, because I'll be interested in, in continuing keeping the piece up and keeping the control. Uh, a lot of people are real short sighted on that. That's why I love Brian's Kurtz's, uh, new e, e letter he's putting out because he talks about all you know, mm-hmm. uh, and tells the real truth and why, why boardroom reports was such a, you know, an is, was a, such a great company and they had the best copywriters in the world and had them locked up, uh, because they knew how to treat them. Mm-hmm. You know, people are just a lot of, and I say people, that's unfair. A lot of people don't get that and it's just to their detriment. So mm-hmm. yeah, in those cases, I just move on, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, I, I would prefer products or projects that have, and I do prefer to have back end potential, ongoing work potential. You know, one off stuff is okay here and there, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to spend six or eight weeks on something that you know. The only my only benefit out of it is it works, so they don't ask me to rewrite it. Right. Uh, that's just really wasted. you want to invest in interest. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it. Why waste? You know, why spend six eight weeks on that when you could spend six eight weeks on something that you know, has the potential to pay you for several years or mm-hmm. whatever it is, yeah. uh, which is less and less. I had a, I had a control online for five years uh, for uh, that. I wrote, I ghost wrote as Donald Trump and that thing lasted literally five years, uh, which what was, was it? It was a, uh, for a real estate deal. Okay. When Trump university, and I think they've gone down the tubes now or something, I, something happened. They got in trouble. Uh, but that thing, they were still running AdWords on it for, uh, in, at year five. Wow. Uh, which I couldn't believe it only took me about two days to write it too. So, you know, I, I didn't mention the fastest writing is the best writing, but that's true in a lot of instances. Well, let's mention your people get that when they mention the name of your site, right? Shortcut yeah. copywriting secrets.com. 
Right. Um, and it and it really, you know, I, I have a whole course, and it really it really is the shortcuts that I know. And it it may be a little misleading because I put people to work in it. Uh, but there are there are literally tons of shortcuts, and it's right. the best way. It's, it's basically Halbert's system, as taught to me. Right. Uh, for and you know he had never put it all down in one place. Um, I wish he would have, but I did it. I I went and basically did that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, ab- absolutely. But I you know I have exercises in every section, and you know if and there are people that don't want to you know do the exercises and they seem mundane or even childish when I tell people to copy out ads in their own Henry, but that's really what works the best and fastest way to get better. Yeah. One of the only ways you can do it. You, know, you have to write to get better at writing. That's just writer. You know, if you want to be a better writer, write. Uh, hey, can I get a drink of water here? Let's Go see. ahead. <laughs> Give me just one second. Here. I'm here in Las Vegas. And- if you've never been to Las Vegas, it sucks every ounce just, of <clears throat> moisture out of you. Just so if you talk for an hour and a half or whatever it is. Scott, just don't tell such great stories and I won't keep asking questions. Okay? <laughs> no, it's cool. So, um, <clears throat> no, I just have a few more questions. I appreciate your time. Um, but So what's been the most dangerous Gary Halbert errand that you had to run? Well, I don't know about errand. Yeah, I'll just tell you some others. It just popped into my mind when you said dangerous. He would do things like he had a, uh, and he loved these things, and they were really cool. They're little saucer boats, and they're a jet ski with the with a saucer edition on the front of them, so they don't turn over as easy, and they just look like little UFOs in the water. Mm-hmm. Well, he thought it was neat to do things like put, you know, and they're they're meant to be jet jet propelled like a jet ski. Okay. Or a ski do, or whatever the current terminology is. I still call them jet skis way back. I know <laughs> what you mean, yeah. Yeah, and I'm not that old. I'm 43, so. <laughs> but, you know, I feel like, like, it seems like a long time ago. But, um, so he thought it would be cool to, to customize these things from time to time. And he put, I think it was two 40-horse Honda four-stroke motors. Whoa. Brand new on the back of this, basically, a jet ski. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't thinking about it. And I know quite a bit about boats. My brothers are professional bass fishermen. Oh, wow. I, I, I do what? I said, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I've been on boats all my life, you know, and I've driven them and all, all that good stuff. But I really wasn't thinking that 80 horsepower was a lot for this thing. <laughs> so he sends, he's, he's at the Bayside Marina in Miami. He has, he has a houseboat there at the time. He's like, God, man, go check this out. I just got it back. But, you know, the steering's kind of loose. And it had, it had an actual steering wheel on it instead of the regular jet ski handlebars. Mm-hmm. And it was it was loose. The linkage was loose. <laughs> it was, like, bolted, bolted on loosely. And so Biscayne uh, Bay's right there leading out to the ocean. He's like, all right, take this out. Check it out. He goes, but one thing, you got to promise me. He's like, just for it once you get out there and get open in the open water. And I dumbly listened to what he said. <laughs> and uh, so in in the, the linkage on the for the throttle, it had a dual throttle on it. And, a, and he fixed that layer to a single. But the linkage was even loose on the throttle. So when he gunned it, it took a minute for it all to catch up. <laughs> and man, those uh, those motors kicked in and it planed out. And there's about a three foot uh, chop. I don't it's, I don't know if you call it chop in the ocean, but whatever. Right. And man, that thing took off and it just never stopped gaining speed. It just got hideous. And before I could think to shut it down, you're, you're going. And if you're on, if you've ever been on the ocean, especially when you're close to it, like on, on, on that jet ski, you can't really see in between the waves. I mean, it all becomes right. you know, like 50 miles an hour. It just, you look like you're going across small waves. Not so. <laughs> I come upon a big gap oh, man. with about a four foot wall on the other side and go down in that. I'm not skimming across. It was it was wide enough that I hit the front of the wave and I hit it sideways and I almost ripped my shoulders out of soccer. Oh, my steering wheel. I can't believe the steering wheel held. How did you not fall off? I don't know. Well, like I said, I could feel 
you know, if you, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I've had it a few times, like from hitting the ground, racing bikes, snowboarding, you can feel your shoulder almost come out of socket and then go back in without tearing any of the, the bursa sack or whatever, but it almost does. I've almost done that several times. Well, that's exactly the feeling. I could feel my shoulders coming out and I just held on well enough and they didn't pop out of place. But here's the thing about that. I was in the middle of Biscayne Bay, which is pretty large there, right, right in downtown Miami. I had no life jacket. I had, you know, no headgear protection. If I'd have hit my head somehow and knocked myself out, I'd been done. Yeah. But if, if my arms would have come out of socket, I wouldn't have been able to swim either. That would have sucked. <laughs> so that's, that's an the, understatement. Yeah, that's one of the uh, the dumbest thing. This that's on me. I mean, I can't believe I listened to that, knowing what I. But you know, Gary could convince you to do a lot of things that were maybe not a, not not uh, in your best interest. <laughs> That, uh, that that was a, that was a good one. Uh, so nah, I'll, tell, I'll, tell, I'll tell I'll tell another good one. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> and this one, I, I remember we went to Key West. This is movement over meditation too. It's actually a story, and we were both going to move there. And we're staying at our friend uh, Rocco's house, or yeah, we're staying we're staying down there for a few days. And I'm thinking about trying to find a place to live, and I'm looking through the paper and doing all this. And finally, Gary grabs the paper from me and goes, you know what? And we're, we're looking for separate places. But he's like, you know, he goes, I don't know where where to, where a good place to stay is. But I do know this movement beats meditation and walked out the door. So he comes back maybe an hour, hour and a half later, something like that. And he's got keys to a place. He's already moved in somewhere. I'm still looking through the paper some more. Uh, so that was a, a really kind of a learning lesson for me. It's like, just get moving. But the end story of that is he was staying above a guy's house in an apartment and he left the water on and, and fell asleep and it flooded the guy's house below. Whoa. And uh, he made me go get his stuff. So I don't know how dangerous that was, but you're talking about not being comfortable. That guy was like, blah, blah, you know, I got run of that storm and the long story short gary ended up paying for the damages and all that stuff but i had to go over and take because you know i'm low man on the totem pole and the road dog i had to go over and take the abuse for that one <laughs> and you know karate oh uh, yeah i mean this this is a, a, a older kind of heavy set guy okay. i mean it was in danger or anything but and i if i would have been that guy i would have been livid too you should have seen the damage <laughs> But that's just a funny Halbert story and, a, and not an untypical one. So, Scott, tell me, what are you working on lately? Where can people check you out? Um, I'm working, I'm, I'm just, uh, I've got several clients going in different, uh, completely different uh, markets, niches, whatever you want to call them. And as far as, you know, I've, I've had my copywriting course out of print. But uh, I do occasionally pull it off the shelf and offer it, you know, on a limited basis. Um, I could set up, if you want to do this, I could set up a page for people that listen to this. Yeah, whatever you want. And they could also go, I mean, go to your site and subscribe. Um, I know you have shortcutcopywritingsecrets.com. Yeah, that's that's the site I would set up on. I mean, they can subscribe to my list and that, that would be fine. Um, I'm not doing any much currently with that, but I'm, I'm in the thought process of revamping everything. Um, but if they just wanted to uh, check out my course and it's an older sales letter I wrote uh, in 2005, but what would be a good, I mean, I can set this up actually let's see here. There's, there's already a page set up. If, if, it says it's shortcut copywriting secrets dot com forward slash shortcut copy course one two dot html. We'll just repeat it one more time so people can write it down or type it in. Let me just make a copy page and just and I'll just use your first name. I'll just put Jeremy dot html. Okay. So shortcut copywriting secrets dot com Jeremy html okay that sounds good and so what pro what kind of projects are you working on lately what's what's some tips from projects you are uh 
Well, been, I mean, oh. obviously, more and more people are, are using uh, video sales letters these days. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm having to do those a little bit more, uh, which is just, you know, it's no big deal. It's, it's still a sales message. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and, you know, all the elements are, are, you know, more or less the same. It's a little bit different, but so more of that kind of stuff. Uh, and it goes back, I've, I've worked in, on infomercial scripts and, and TV with my, with my prepper client. We, we did videos that weren't video sales letters, but we did um, videos and well, I've, I've even done radio and stuff recently, radio scripts. Hmm. So that's another thing, you know, uh, radio and print. I, I've done quite a bit of space uh, through that client, uh, newspaper and, and magazine, um, and, and I'm still uh, direct mail. I mean, those things aren't dead. In fact, <clears throat> as far as, you know, what I hear is direct mail is, is in a lot of cases working better than ever because the clutter is cleared out and and the price has gone up and, you know, that, that clears them out. I, I remember Halbert used to say, you know, he goes, I don't care if postage goes to a buck, you know, a letter. He goes, I want it to because it clears out all the people, you know, the competition. Right. Uh, you know, there's a limit to that. If it's uh, two bucks to send your letter or three bucks, you know, there's obviously some kind of limit where it becomes unprofitable. But, you know, his general feeling about that was somewhat correct. He's like, I don't care how much, yeah. you know, because it, it'll clear people out. <clears throat> yeah, there's a more of a barrier to entry. So people won't, won't do it. Yeah. So, and I know a lot of people, especially in their house, it's a big neglected thing by uh, people who are predominantly online is, is mailing to their house list. And even when they do it, they do it so poorly or, or have no, you know, real follow up with it. it. It probably wasn't much worth doing. What kind of format do you like sending in direct mail? You know, cause I know you mentioned postcards, you, you mentioned a couple different type of things that people would mail. What do you like? What do you prefer? I still start out with a, with a, <clears throat> you know, Halbert, and I don't know if you're familiar with this. He had an A pile, B pile speech that he always gave and he's written it in a lot of places and an APAL piece of mail is is a number 10 envelope no teaser copy a live first class stamp or per, or a uh, commemorative stamp mm -hmm. in the in the corner card you don't identify yourself you just use the street address um, and then you know their their address either hand handwritten or typed and I do that because those get open more often than not and you, and then you can go from there you can test Excuse me. It's those are really hard to beat. Really? Real Why hard. no return address? No, you have a return address. Oh, you do. No, no, no name, no company name. Oh, gotcha. Because no, you don't want to identify it as a piece of commercial mail. Got it. Now, if you have Acme Inc. and then one, two, three, you know, any street, right. they, they pretty much know. Then hey, this is not from Aunt Betty. But if it's a, if it's handwritten in blue ink right. with a commemorative stamp, they don't know. You know, so they almost have to open it. Right. Because it could be anything. It could be a check from Aunt Betty. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it could be, um, you know, it looks like a personal piece of correspondence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's the reasoning for that. And if, if you went to the GaryHalbertLetter.com and search A pile, B pile, you could read his full explanation. Mm -hmm. and that's how he had his biggest winner ever with the, with the coat of arms letter that mailed, you know, up to, uh, you know, close to a billion times before it was retired. Right. Um you know, he, he made it look personal and that was a big breakthrough for him because he was doing at the time what all the direct mail gurus were telling him to do. You know, you need teaser copy, yes, no tokens, a brochure. And uh, he, he was doing that and he was losing money, all of his money, all the time, like not even being able to pay the electric and all that stuff. And finally, he just sat down and said, you know, if I had to... Um, make this thing work no matter what. If I was going to be beheaded, if this thing didn't work or, you know, uh, it's kind of crass or if they were, somebody was going to come kill one of my children, uh, what would I do? And he just developed that concept of like, well, the first thing you got to do is you got to get the, the mail delivered. And, and people, you know, they throw away junk mail, post office carriers, but they almost never throw away first class mail and especially something that looks personal. So that's a, number one thing. And then two, you got to get it open because if it's not open, it doesn't matter. And if you give them a reason on the outside, it's like, Hey, you know, here's a way to save, you know, half off on your, your next oil change. 
they can dismiss that instantly and toss it right in the, in the trash can. And I'm not going to repeat his whole deal. And, and but you know, that's basically, that's the idea of that. And uh, so I, that's my default is an A pile personal looking piece of mail. And I, I pretty much stick with that unless I'm, unless I, I got a client that just, you know, is going to insist on some kind of teaser test. I'll do it. Uh, especially with some of the bigger guys. And it, and it, and it's probably not impossible to beat an A pile piece of mail from time to time, but again, really, really hard. So just to be safe, I start with that. Um, and, and I don't, I don't really write Magalog. You mentioned other formats, book logs or Magalogs. Uh, those, those are, I, I don't really do those um, just because it's really hard work. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you've got to have a designer. I mean, it just, yeah. I mean, if I was a lot little, more components. Yeah. It's, it's just a, di- it's a little bit different kind of, uh, I, it's not that I can't do them. Um, it's just, it's just a lot more work. Um, What's the B pile? B pile is anything that looks obviously commercial. Okay. You know, any uh, publisher's clearinghouse, um, you know, bill enclosed, on, written on the outside of it. You know, here's here's how to, Carrie used to use the, you know, here's how to save or how to get time in half off this year. Um, anything like that that identifies it from the outset or even on the inside. And, and it's really worked people to read his a pile b pile speech uh, in written form or hear it in, in from you know a seminar or something like that but uh if 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 you have a plain envelope on the outside and they open it up and a bunch of crap falls out of it, like a brochure and right. you know, all this you get what he called the oh yuck factor and then 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 they toss it so that does no good either it still needs to look personal okay. when you open it as well yeah. and be, be as personal as you can you know, one to one talking to a like you were going to talk to a friend at the bar, you know, depending on your market. But generally, this is good advice. And, um, you know, it needs to seem personal as well in the writing, you know, like like you would talk to a friend. Yeah. So, Scott, my last question is, what's just leave people before we part with one of your best piece of advice? What should they start doing right now? Because we obviously heard a lot of great information. What's one of your best pieces of advice of where they should implement right now? For just for improving their copy. Oh, improving their sales. Yeah. One of the best things I ever did, and it just depends on where you're at was copy good sales letters out by hand. And I left this out of the story and, and I, I, <clears throat> that I just skipped over it. But one of the things I did and one of the things I mentioned in the, in the handwritten letter to, to Gary Howard was uh, I didn't have any of his good copy back then. You know, it's not like today where you can go on and find everything online. People are spoiled. So I didn't have anything but I had his Max Money book and I, I wrote the whole book out by hand. I wow. figured copying some of his writing was better. And I didn't, I never showed that to him and he never asked me to prove that I did that. I never showed that to him until the last time of, before he passed away, we went to my storage. I brought it with me just not on purpose. It was just in some stuff. I said, Hey, by the way, you know, I never showed this to you. And I showed him the, the three, three by five binder. And, you know, I had regular notebook paper. I just written it out all the way through there. But uh, yeah, I mean, copying good sales letters by hand, if you're at that level, um, is one of the very best things you can do. Uh, and I did that for years and years and years. I mean, even five, six, seven years into my career, especially if I had time off, if I took a little bit of extra time off, just I would do it to warm up, hmm. you know, and get my mind right. Uh I don't do it so much anymore just because I've just I've gotten busy enough that it's it's you're doing it all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's like I need to get up and start writing, and I don't, I don't really, you know, after a while, you'll 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 get away from it at some point, probably. But it's certainly great advice. Um, you know, it's just what we talked about. You know, think about your offers, um, improve your salesmanship skills. Uh, Gary, you know, he always mentioned to me, it's like. You know, at a point you should read salesmen's books by salesmen, you know, especially really, really tough, street savvy salesmen. 
Um, a good one is uh, how I raised my, myself from failure to success in selling by Frank Betcher. Hmm. And it's, it's spelled, his last name is B-E-T-T-G-E-R. <clears throat> so it's kind of, it doesn't sound like it's spelled. But B-E-T-T-G-G-E-R? Yes. Oh. Let me make sure that's correct. But I, I believe it is. That's that's a really good book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'm I'm definitely not the first person to recommend this. I, a lot of really good copywriters. Uh, yeah, it's Betcher B E two T's and then a yeah. G E R. Yeah. So Scott, yeah. Th- oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, he he always encouraged me to read about salesmanship uh, you know after i'd gotten all the basics in and uh <clears throat> because you know that's where he got he was a door-to-door encyclopedia salesman right. and a lot of that paid off in spades that's yeah. that's where he kind of you know that was kind of a genesis for his a pal b pal because he learned stuff in encyclopedia sales that you know he went against what you were told to do dress sharp be alert you know say yes ma'am he did things completely contrary and and that goes back to the statement i made about you know if you want to be successful find out what everybody's doing and do the opposite right so uh you know he finally just came to the senses is like i keep losing all my money even the rent this isn't right what would i do if this had to work and right. uh, that's where that came yeah. from <clears throat> scott this has been hugely valuable i want to be the first one to thank you 